Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Come on, today we're going to sing loud. We're going to exalt the name of Jesus. Come on, this is a newer song. This is Living Now. Come on, let's sing it with faith. Every word that we say today. All right, here we go. Waking up knowing there's a reason. All my dreams come alive. Life is for living with you i made my decision you fill me up fill my eyes with wonder forever young in your love this freedom's untainted with you no moment is wasted Here we go. you see the sun now bursting through the clouds black and white changing color all the Come on, church, sing it. This is living now. This is living now. You lead the way. You lead the way. God, you're right beside me. In your love, I'm complete. It's nothing like living with you. This life you created, I choose to see the sun, see the sun now bursting through the clouds, black and white, turn the color all around, all is new in the Savior I am found. Come on, this is living now. Black and white, turn the color all around. All is new in the Savior I found. Yeah, yeah. See, see the sun now bursting through the clouds. Black and white, turn the color all around. All is new in the Savior I found. Come on, church, this is living.
Is it possible to be pure when we're naturally so corrupt? Does God really expect us to be perfect? We serve a pure God, and He desires purity and holiness. You're about to hear a message in a series we call Pure, where you'll learn that no matter what you've done in the past, you can be pure. Join us as we discover the keys to living pure before God while living in an impure world. It's so good to see you this morning and to be back. You know, it's good to go, but it's good to be back, and we really missed you. Well, but we was up in the house with the live stream watching you on a little telephone, you know what I mean? But it still was great. I appreciate the staff. Uh, and I, I thought about this. Uh, I, I was going to say I appreciate the staff covering for me, but that's the wrong statement to make. I appreciate the staff bringing the Word of God to you in the way that God would have it. And so... Uh, it's so, so wonderful to know that God's got a great team. And uh, just to let you know, Jan, I had a great time. Started off in the Big Apple with a whole lot of excitement, a lot of crazy folk up in New York City, you know, a lot of stuff going on. And then we shifted gears into Boston, which was a little bit smaller, but still different. And we ended up in Portland, Maine, quiet, just us and the lobsters. And, uh, and then we came back, just a great time. We're so excited to be with you and uh, uh, to just, uh, you know, bless you. And uh, we're excited about our Guatemala trip. Uh, we've got a group of people from Northwood and others together. We got an email this morning from Glennis Randall, and I wanted to share some of it with you very, very quickly here. Uh, she says, so many miracles, signs and wonders. One blind man was healed, three young boys healed of deafness. <laughs> Now, get this. This will encourage you to go on the next mission trip. I heard a four-year-old boy say his first word. Come on now. You know, being able to speak. We had a stroke stopped in the name of Jesus. It was in process, right, right in progress, and another having a heart attack. He said when they prayed for him, he jumped up. He had, before that, could hardly walk, couldn't work. He just started running all around the countryside, everywhere. Just wonderful things happening. And so many lives have been changed. Northwood has added more food to the mission. 100 families are being fed a month's supply of food at uh, 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 the local church where we're attending today. And so, you know, it's just a small group from Northwood going with another group doing great things. And this is what we do, and this is what Jesus is all about. Just to give you a report of Nepal, Nepal is in an appalling position. It's a horrible situation. You can pray. We have given. We're going to give more money. They need, they need help. It's just terrible. We're in almost daily contact with a pastor, a pastor there. And, of course, Rick and Beverly Zachary oversee that work. And uh, so we're just right on top of that. It's bad. It's tough for the people. Uh, but Jesus is Lord, and, uh, and there's a life after this life. You know, if you're wondering about your life right now and said, I don't know, it's not so good, well, just hang on because there's a better life a coming. Uh, I can tell you that. And that's what we've really been talking about the last couple of weeks, about a pure heart and a pure life, pure, a pure mind, pure heart. And we're going to kind of continue that today with a pure life. And uh, a pure life is not a perfect life because we are imperfect people and we serve a perfect God. You'll learn about that next week. And we're in an imperfect world. Amen. It, just, it just is the way it is. You know, most drinking water uh, is, is okay to drink. I was thinking about that in New York City. I mean, how they move all that water and all the other stuff. Uh, I, you know, I don't know how they do it. It's just, but anyway, drinking water is, is pure enough to drink. It's not free of all contaminants. But it, 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 there's a certain standard that has to be met in order for, us, for it to be healthy. And then whatever is left over in the water, our body has the ability to fight it off, and, and we're all right with that, and we live okay. So it is with life, you know, we strive to do things that are productive, that are, that are helpful, programs that function, that affect people in the proper way. Uh, our government seeks to do that. You know, our school systems seek to produce products that are helpful. And even the church, uh, our goal is to produce environments and products, if you would, that help people grow in God and, and get their life straight. And we don't always do things the way they ought to be done, I guess. Everybody makes mistakes. 
I keep trying to be perfect and I'm imperfect and sometimes that could get mighty frustrating if you know what I'm talking about. And so today, I don't want to lay on you some heavy burden of something you ought to do. I just want to give you help and, and help you to go further another step in obtaining a pure life. Heard somebody say the other day they were comparing religions and the guy said, well, uh, our religion is, is, the, is the best because we have more rules. <laughs> And that's sometimes how we look at things. Uh, whatever religion has the most rules to keep, that's probably the best one, but it's not always that way. So the pure heart that you were uh, taught week before last, the, the pure mind that you were taught last week, those two culminate into a pure life. And uh, I wrote this down last night late. I said, what would it be like if people led pure lives? What would it be like? And, and in Psalm 119, verse 9, the, the Bible asks a question. It says, how can a young person stay pure? And I might just kind of expand that and just say, how can a person stay pure? And then it answers the question by saying, by obeying the word. But I just kind of want to zero in on how can a person stay pure? What about this pure life? And, uh, and, and so I'm going to give you some I'm just gonna talk to you about what a pure life could look like and let you know right off, can I go all the way to the end of the message and say it's attainable. It can really, really happen. Thing about a pure life is that a pure life is a principled life. And, and principles are not something that you get instantly. Principles are not like if there's a fire in your backyard, you grab the water hose, turn the faucet on, and put the fire out. That's how we want to live, and, but principles do not work that way. Principles are built over a period of time. And that's why when situations arise, how we respond shows how principled we are. This week in your one-year Bible, I think it was Tuesday morning, you read about King Saul, the king of Israel, was at a place. He was getting ready to go to battle with the Philistines, the enemies of God, but he was having to wait on the prophet Samuel to come and to offer a sacrifice before he went to battle. And Samuel was delayed for whatever reason. And because of that, Saul got edgy and his troops began to scatter. He saw the enemy, he saw his troops scattering, and Samuel wasn't coming to offer the sacrifice, so he jumped in and he offered the sacrifice himself, which the king was not authorized to do. The prophet was to offer the sacrifice, the king was to fight wars and build cities. And so he offered the sacrifice, and as soon as he was doing that, Samuel showed up and asked him the question, what are you doing? He said, well, they were, my men were running away, the enemy's there, you wouldn't come in. And so I did that and Samuel said, you know, you've done a really foolish thing and because of that, God is gonna take the kingdom away from you. What's the, what's the problem? What's the point of the story? The point is that if he would have lived a principled life rather than an emotional or circumstantial life, rather than reacting, knee jerk reaction to something, things would have been totally different. And things can be totally different in our life. A pure life is a principled life. You see, our, our, our motives uh, are regulated and our decisions are regulated by principle. So if you're in a place right now, this morning, right now, where there is uh, the opportunity for you to react to whatever's going on in your life, whether it's in a relationship, whatever it is, I would say stop right where you are and examine your principles to see whether or not you're going to make your decision based on that or by some emotions. And I will tell you this, emotional decisions always cost you down the line. They always do. And so rather than living by regret, let's live by wisdom and see what happens. Pure life 
is a principled life and the pure life is also a very, very transparent life, a life that you can see straight through. It's clean, it's clear. There are no hidden agendas. There are no, no closets, there are no trap doors. There, there's not a closet to hide a skeleton in. I think we've got too many closets, too many places where we can allow things to happen that way. And th there's no smoke, there's no mirrors, there's, there, there's no distortion. It's absolutely pure, no deception. The thing I love about children, little children, is that they're so transparent. You ask them a question, you get the truth right off. I mean, matter of fact, I remember our children, yours are the same, they'll just say anything. I mean, when they're in a store and they're behind somebody and, and they're always short, and so they see things from a different vantage point, they call it like it is. What they see, they say. <laughs> Makes you embarrassed, but they just don't think, it. their life is totally transparent. I mean, you know, if, if they got a problem, they got a problem. You know, it's not like they're trying to hide anything, except sometimes when you're potty training they, and they get to a certain age, they start to hide behind the door, knowing that they've created a problem that they don't want to deal with at that particular moment, but they're very, very transparent. What did you do today? Well, I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that, you know, and they just tell it like it is. In Titus chapter one, verse 15, it says, everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure, but nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving because their minds and consciences are corrupted. Such people claim they know God, but they deny him by the way they live. They are detestable and disobedient, worthless for doing anything good. So, man, when you're pure, everything's pure. When you're pure, sometimes you just don't get the nasty joke at the job. You just don't get it. You know, I mean, I grew up, we, we were all nasty, man. You know I mean? You know, we would just cuss and lie and cheat and steal and tell dirty jokes. And, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, I mean, I have a memory, but sometimes I don't get a dirty joke. I'll hear something and I, it, I don't get it. And I'm so happy when I find out I didn't get it. It's like there's a little bit of purity right there. Thank you, Lord, for that little crumb of purity there. Come on now. It's like when you're wrong, you simply need to admit you're wrong. Did you know it's okay to be wrong? Do you know that, that the church needs to be a family where people can be wrong and not be executed? D d dream with me for a moment. Dream with me about a church where people are not executed when they miss the mark. Now, I have to clarify because we're religious people and we're saying, yeah, but what about? The what about is that you know already that sinning against God is not acceptable. You also know that in your imperfection, you miss the mark. And it's in the missing of the mark that the church has to be a family that rather than executing those who make one side step, they're people who bring life and healing and restoration. Because people are coming into the church now in all three of our locations, and not only this church, all over the United States and the world. Their lives are beat up, torn up for various reasons, and they don't think like church people think and they don't live like church people live. And so somehow or another, we have to open our arms at least as wide as Jesus. And say, come on in. And then trust that the Holy Spirit will do his work and that they will respond to the Holy Spirit's work. Because when a person responds to the Holy Spirit's work, purity takes place, transparency takes place. And I'll tell you another thing takes place. This pure life becomes an honest life. In the practical side of it, it becomes such an honest life that we start paying our bills. You know, you say, I'm holy, but you don't pay your light bill. You understand? And so we pay our bills, we pay our taxes. 
especially self-employed people. Give an invoice and file that thing and give Caesar what Caesar's. You obey the laws, you respect authority. Things like school teachers, you respect them. Things like police officers. Now, I haven't said much. Matter of fact, I've said nothing about what's going on in our nation concerning our policemen and our citizens. And there's a lot going on, and it's a big issue. And people are playing a lot of cards about this thing. And I just want to say this, that everyone is imperfect. And if you are in bookkeeping and you make a mistake, you backspace on your computer and you retype a number. When you're in the inner city and guns are being fired and someone gets killed, you can't backspace. And there is no justification for murder whether it's murder between two citizens or between law enforcement and citizens. Nothing justifies murder. The systems we have are supposed to work within the parameters of what is going on with honesty. And even within our system, sometimes there's corruptness. I don't have the answer for it because people are imperfect and many people are absolutely corrupt. But I will say this, before you rant and rave, would you pray? Before you condemn a police officer, pray. Before you condemn a citizen, pray. I like the few, one or two sane people who are in the news departments of our national news services who stop and say, can we wait until we get the facts before we condemn a life. You, know, you understand? So I don't always know. I just say, let's live honest lives. I don't plan on being shot by a police officer at 3 a.m. outside of a crazy place in Gulfport. I'm going to be in, you're going to have to come to my house, break through my door, go through my alarm, get in my bedroom and shoot me because I ain't going to be there. And I could, I could go on and on about this, but you understand I'm trying to bring balance and peace and let's act like Christians, people who know God and understand that this world is sinking. Quit trying to straighten all the pictures out on the Titanic and let's get some people in some lifeboats. Amen. Amen. Okay. And I'm sure I didn't do the best job on that. And I'm sure some of you have greater and stronger opinions. And I may even hear from you. And uh, <laughs> next time we have this horrible situation, you can come up here and try to do a better job than I did. Let's quit killing each other. Let's shed a little love. Come on now. Let's do what's right. And let's do unto others as we would have them do unto us. And let's love God and love people. And let's, let's live a life, an honest life in every situation, a pure life. It's a servant's life. You know, sometimes serving gets to be tough. Sometimes when you only serve, you feel like maybe you're on the bottom, but Jesus says you're on the top. You see, you can serve until there's hardly anything left. You feel like, oh wow, I need to be served a while. You know, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't like to be served that much. I mean, at a restaurant, I can get up and get my own ketchup. I'm just that way. I have a hard time. Some of these hotels we stayed in, I mean, they like want to do everything for you. They have a motive, of course. It's called a tip. <laughs> but it's like, I can carry my bag to my room. It's on rollers. But generous people are servants and they always have others in mind. That's how we test how pure our heart is, is where are we motivated? Are we motivated to where it's something that we're going to be lifted up in ourselves? Is it good for me or is it good for you? Which do I go to first? 
what's good for me or what's good for you. Can you imagine living a life to where you always go to other people? It's like, I see the hurt there. I see the pain there. I see the need there. I see the situation there. I want to help there. I'm going to help this person. Some people would think that's such a small life. Jesus says it's a big life. You know, the Bible teaches us that if you water somebody else's life, you will be watered. Jesus said, if you give, it'll be given to you. Did you know that the Bible teaches us that if we ask, we will receive, if we ask with proper motives? Motives, I mean, that's a, that, that's a huge thing in this pure life. What's motivating you? Man, you know, to, to have a life where there's no ulterior motives, to where you're just like, hey, this is who I am, and this is how I operate. The servant's life. You start putting all these things together, they, they, they paint this beautiful picture. You know, the next thing about this pure life I love, it's a peaceful life. You wanna know how to have peace in your life? Watch this. You will never get caught if you're living pure. You, you will never have to worry about an affair. S stealing, cheating. Slanting the truth, slandering, misquoting, taking up offense, lying, deceiving, judging, fussing, fighting, hyper-opinionated, political, ambitious, jealous, envious, insecure, or paranoid. If you live a pure life, it's a peaceful life. One of our pastors said several years ago, and a man started coming to the church and uh, he, he, he was coming to church one Sunday morning, he drove up and, 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 and he didn't stay in church. And, and so the pastor noticed he wasn't there. So the next week he said, hey, bro, I noticed that you, you weren't uh, you, you in church. What, you all right? You doing okay? He said, oh, pastor. He said, I drove up last Sunday. And what had happened, one of, one, one of the guys in the church is the police officer. And so he was on duty, but he just swung by the church and just swung in and parked his police car right out front and came in and tell everybody, hi, I got a cup of coffee, you know. And he said, I, I drove up to church. He said, and I got out the car and I started walking towards the building. And he said, all of a sudden, I saw that Popo was there. I didn't know, but that's the slang, I guess, for police officers. I don't know, but he said, I saw him there. I saw the car there. And he said, I had had a few drinks. He said, so I couldn't go in there. I got in my car, and I took off, and I ran home, and I got in my house and closed the door. What a way to live, man. I mean, come on. But you know what? If you don't have anything to hide... You're not going to hide. Right. Isn't that right? If the police drive up to your home this afternoon, how do you feel? If you get, the, I tell you, if you run out the back door, you hide something. <laughs> if you run in the bathroom and you flush the toilet without using it, you're probably hiding something. You know what I'm talking about. I remember one night we were doing something we weren't supposed to be doing, and we had a big intersection. There's a police officer over there parked right here. We're here, and I, was, I felt like I had ants crawling all over my body. You talk about paranoid. I just knew he's coming. <laughs> when that light changes, what are we going to do? I mean, I was already had an exit plan. That happened last week. No, not really, not really. No, that was a long time ago, a long time ago. It's a peaceful life. This pure life is a peaceful life, man. Come on, let's get some peace up in the house. No purity, though, no peace. One more thing. You want one more about this pure life? 
This pure life, it is a powerful and it is a fearless life. It's powerful and it's fearless when you're pure. Something about purity, pure gold. Something about it. You, you can tell pure gold. Did you know that pure gold jewelry is not as shiny as fake gold jewelry? If you bought your wife something, hey wise, and that thing is so shiny, hey, you, he bought you junk. <laughs> he bought you some junk. And if, 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 you, if he bought you a necklace and your neck is turning green, you don't have a disease. <laughs> you hear me? It's not a disease. You've got, you've got this cheap junk. I speak for all women. If you can't buy me something worth something, don't buy me something at all when it comes to jewelry. Jesus one day is talking to his disciples and he said this. He said, the prince of this world and in other places in the gospel, he had defined the prince of this world as Satan himself. He said, the prince of this world is coming. I can't talk to you any longer. That's what he said. I can't, we can't talk any longer. We're, we're done. The prince of, he's coming, but he will find nothing in me. In essence, what Jesus was saying is, I am pure. There's no defilement in me. There's no stronghold. There's no handle that he can get. There's no foothold. He finds nothing in me. He can sift my entire life, my entire thought life. I am pure and thus he has no power and because he has no power, I have no fear. Amen. There it is. You understand the pure life? That's what the pure life is. Jesus said, I'm pure, and so I have power, and I'm not afraid of anything. I'm telling you, when you, when you don't have anything to hide, you uh, don't have to worry about anything. At all. You don't have any fear. So when you're looking for the pure life, one thing you gotta do, you gotta get a greater vision than what's going on in this world. You, you have to. When, when, when you are who God says you are, then you are acceptable to God. Amen. It really doesn't matter what people say about you Amen. unless you act in the fool. But if you've got a pure life, it doesn't matter what people are saying about you because that's not the, the, the point. The point is what does God say about you? And when you agree with what God says about you, you are everything God intended you to be. Because being what God intended you to be is not all made up by what you do, but by who you are. John chapter one, verse three, all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. You know what John was talking about? He was talking about eternity. He was talking about the, the end eternity all the way when you have a hope that you will see Jesus when you understand I mean when you really get into it then you start keeping yourself straight you really believe it and Philippians 4 8 we cut it down real short but you know it says fix your thoughts on what is pure in other words give your energy to what is pure now you're sitting out here right now if you're, you're right now say this this thing of pure life it's that's a, that's a life that I think I want how do I get it how is it going to happen in my own personal life well I, I want to tell you uh, and I'm going to preface the, the end of this with this statement a pure life does not guarantee you a life void of much trouble and hardship I have taught you some of you for over 25 years, that if you think the Christian life is easy street and that everything goes right just because you follow God, you're mistaken. Embrace the trouble. 
Embrace the problems that life brings, the challenges, because some people experience more challenges than other people. It is just the way it is. I have not figured it out. Some countries suffer more than other countries. Some businesses suffer more than other businesses, and some families suffer more than other families. But if we'll keep our eyes on Jesus, everything will be all right, because Pure living has absolutely nothing to do with what you will get out of it as much as it being God's best for you. Now, two ways this thing happens. Purifying takes place in two ways. Number one, God purifies. God does that. He disciplines. He uses fiery trials. He works on our life. Malachi chapter 3 verse 2 says, For you will be like a blazing fire that refines metal, or like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. He will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away the dross. God's working in your life to purify your life. Get your eyes off of the trial and on to the Lord. Let the Lord work. He's doing something that's going to be great. He uses trials. He uses discipline. If you're, if you're wrong and you don't repent, he removes his presence from you. That's why David said in Psalm 51, after he committed the adulterous affair with Bathsheba and murdered her husband, he said, Lord, above everything, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Please don't take your breath. He knew that the way that God disciplines is he removes his presence. He steps back from your life and removes his presence. God purifies. James tells us to count it joy when trials come. God uses circumstances. He uses situations. He uses people. He's haunting your life. He's more interested in your future, your eternity than right now. He will use things to sharpen you, things that hurt you, things that don't make any sense. He'll, he'll let people do you wrong so that he can do you right. He will allow people to hurt you so that he can help you. And we don't like to say that because we think it's all an easy streak and like a grease rail, but it's not. It really isn't. He purifies that way. That's what he uses. And then, of course, number two is that we purify Think about the human body as this. When something's wrong up in here, the human body's going to do something about it. You know what I'm talking about? It's going to get rid of the problem inside, up or down or sideways. You know that for a fact. Sometimes you wonder, why is my nose running so much? Because the histamines, it's, there's something up in your cavities that's got to get rid of it. The way the body does is flush it out, man. That's what happens. And, and you know what happens when your little boy is feeling so bad and then he throws up. And next thing you know, he's out in the backyard playing. Because his body got rid of, he was purged of that thing. And we are the agent of purging in our life also. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, Paul in, verse, in chapter 6 was telling them, hey, Corinthian church, you mixed up with some people. You're doing some things that are not what God wants you to do. You need to stop it. You need to come out from among those kinds of people. You need to be separate. And if you'll do that, I'll be your God and you'll be my people and we'll get along just fine. And I promise you that I'll take care of you. And then in chapter 7, verse 1, he says, because of those promises, let us, what does he say? He says, because of that, we want to go ahead and cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or our spirit. So you have an active part in the purification process. And God will use all sorts of outside influences to do that. He'll use your parents. He'll use your teachers. He'll use the law. He'll use pastors preaching the gospel to you and loving you. Small groups, you name it. God has a myriad of instruments available to him to aid you in living the pure life. But you have to desire it. You got to want it. I figured it out, folks. Took me a long time. I'm slow. If people don't want something, they never get it. It's just the way it is. No matter what it is, you have to have a desire. Then you, you want to you, you pursue it. You got to put forth some energy and some effort pursuing that thing. Like the deer running, he just pursues the water because he's so thirsty. You know what I'm saying? You got to pursue it. 
You do that by the word of God. You do that by, you know, oh God, we know how to pursue God, most of us. And if you don't, just sit on the edge of your bed and say, God, I want to pursue you. Teach me. And believe me, God will begin to teach you and instruct you on how to pursue him. He wants to be pursued. He likes when you chase him. And did you know this? That every person in this room can possess a pure life. Let me tell you something, folks. We live in a nasty world. It's pathetic. It's already doomed. This world is going to burn up in fire sooner or later. We are being prepared for eternity. And God is coming back for a pure bride. And he will have it. I want to be a part of it. I do. And so, you know, when we, when we do this, when we possess and, and when we purify, we, we repent, we, we, we just say, Lord, you know, I've been involved in some things or whatever. I, I don't even want to even give a list of anything. Our heart needs to pump for God. And when our heart pumps for God and our spirit and our conscience is alive, the Holy Spirit puts his finger on whatever he wants to adjust in your life. It could be good things or bad things. Some good things are bad for you if God doesn't want you involved in that good thing. But no man can tell you that. That's what's so glorious about what we're involved in. God is involved in it. And he goes where no man can go. And he doesn't use a list of rules and regulations. He uses his voice to speak to you. Church, I want to pray with you right now. I want to pray that this word that we just heard would be active and alive. Come on, right there, right where you're sitting. If you know God and you're, you're there, just say, Father, I just, you know, examine my life. Burn up every impurity. Father, would you burn up every impurity in our life? Would you prick our conscience? Give us wisdom as we seek you. Father, prepare your church for your coming. May we live every day with our fire burning bright, ready to see you come. Now let's all bow our heads together, everybody in the place. And I want to talk just briefly for you who maybe are in this room and you say, you know what? I, I, don't, I don't know Jesus. I'm not sure about all. I, 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 I'm not completely convinced yet. I, I don't know if I'm one with God. I don't know if my heart is right, but I want it right. I'm just going to ask you not to leave this room until your heart is right. And the way we're going to do that is that we just approach God. He allows us to do that. And I want to help you do that. I want to pray for you right where you are. I believe that as we pray. And if we mean it, if our heart is open, God comes and God changes things. So right now, you who are in this room, if, 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 if you say, Pastor, my heart needs to be changed. I need my sins forgiven. I desire to be one with Jesus. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I just want you to lift your hand up right where you are. Just shoot your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me. That's right, right over there. Thank you. Come on, just shoot it up. Thank you. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you over here. Yes, sir. You have to have your heart right. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You mean business with God. This is not getting into religion. It's not all about joining a church right now. It's about one-on-one -on -one with you and God. Anybody else in this room, if you haven't raised your hand, shoot it up and say, Pastor, I want to pray. I want that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Right now, let me pray with you. You mean business with God. You, you really mean business. So just say this prayer. Repeat after me. Say, Father in heaven, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And I believe that Jesus died for me and that he rose from the dead. 
I give you my life, Father. I invite you to come live inside of me and change me. I want to live for you. I want to be your son or daughter. I'm yours now, fully committed. And I thank you for receiving me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. The decision to follow Christ is just the beginning of your relationship with God. So we'd love to help you with your next steps. If you'll go to northwood.tv slash connect and fill out the information, our lead pastor, Van Decody, wants to send you a letter that tells you some steps to take in order to maintain your new relationship with God. We'll also give you some information about Northwood Church. We are one church in multiple locations. We have a campus in Gulfport, Wiggins, and Long Beach. If you live in one of these areas, we'd love to see you at one of our services. You can visit our website, northwood.tv slash locations for service times and directions. If you'd like to give to this ministry, you can do that online as well. Just go to northwood.tv slash give you can give a one-time donation or you can sign up for our online community called MyNC and set up a recurring payment. Thanks again for joining us today. We'll see you next time.